These five people are worth over half a billion pounds and are ready to invest their own money in the best business ideas they hear. But will anyone convince them to part with their cash? It really isn't an investment for me. I'm afraid I wouldn't back you. I just question, really, why you've even turned up today. You're not really a businesswoman, are you? You've just lost me completely. Completely out. I'm not interested. I'm not investing. Dragon's Den, five multimillionaires are about to arrive, ready to invest hundreds of thousands of pounds of their own cash in new business ideas. They'll meet aspiring entrepreneurs who'll pitch their ideas and ask for as much money as they want. So who are our five millionaires, the dragons in the den? Our first dragon is Duncan Bannatyne. He's worth more than £130 million. This Glaswegian entrepreneur has set up and sold several businesses and currently owns Bannatyne's, the health club chain. Doug Richard is a Californian entrepreneur who made millions buying and selling software companies. He now runs Library House, a high-tech investment company in Cambridge. Rachel Elnor is one of the UK's leading business women. Her company, Red Letter Days, takes experiences like driving luxury sports cars and sells them as gift packages. It's valued at £25 million. Simon Woodruff left school with just three O-levels and spent years working in the music business before launching Yo Sushi, a Japanese-style restaurant chain which made him millions. At 38, Peter Jones is worth more than £300 million. His extraordinary business fortune began at just 16 when he started his own tennis academy. He now runs Phones International, a thriving telecoms company. Our multimillionaire investors are going to see dozens of pitches from budding entrepreneurs desperate for cash to start their businesses. There's only one rule, they must get at least what they ask for or they don't get a penny. First into the dragon's den is David Tully from Blackpool. Now he wants to escape his job as an IT consultant and go it alone with a new product he's devised. But for that he needs £50,000. Remember he has to get at least that or he goes away with nothing. Hello Dragons, my name's David and I'm here to promote Maximat. I'm looking for an investment of £50,000. Maximat is an odour absorbing mat for dogs. Using a number of filters within the mat, it actually absorbs the smell from a dog. Um, the filters are replaced every three months. There's two sizes, the retail price of the large mat is 20 quid, and the smaller mat will cost £15. This product is not only useful for dogs, it can be used on shoes. So if you've got a smelly pair of feet, take your shoes off, put this mat over the top of them and it will actually absorb the smell. We're hoping to use it for the dogs initially, but the second line promotion is to use it for shoes and trainers as well. There's nothing like it in the UK, there's nothing like it in Europe, and as far as I'm aware, there's nothing like it in the world. So you can see the potential. Thank you. David is offering a 10% stake in his company in return for the £50,000 he needs. All he has to do now is convince the dragons his odour-absorbing mat is worth investing in. So, tell me first of all, how did you come here? You do, you're a dog owner? No. no You've right. got smelly shoes? I've got smelly shoes. So is that how you got interested in it? No, my brother-in-law, who's my partner, he's got a number of dogs and they smell. And he was trying to think of a way of making the dog less smelly. He's been using one of these for 12 months. Over that period of time, not only the dog, but the actual room loses that smell. So you can walk into the lounge now and you don't smell dog. But some dog owners perhaps like the smell of their own dog. Um, I've yet to meet one, to be honest. I mean, we, we've put well, this product... I, I can tell you, I'm one. You like the smell of your dog? Absolutely, because I keep the dog clean and 
I, I wouldn't want to, to put a dog on a, on a mat that gives it some sort of sweet rose smell. It I doesn't mean, give it a sweet rose smell. What does it what do? What it does is it absorbs the smell from the dog. And when the, the dog walks away, does the dog then, is it free from its, its dog smell? The more the dog uses the mat, the, fr the fresher the dog. It's not going well. Peter Jones clearly has reservations about the product. It seems David has found himself pitching to the one millionaire investor who actually likes the smell of his dog. Rachel Elnor has also got concerns. Do you have any business experience? Yeah, no, I've run um, uh, some businesses before. And have they been profitable? Yes. One so is... what happened to them? Well, one was a sunbed business. Why aren't you doing that anymore? The unfortunate thing was working full time on my day job and then doing. The what's, the, <coughs> what's the day job? Uh, IT. Are you still going to do the day job? No, I'm, I'm due to. At the moment, I'm contracting, um, and I'm so due you're to give up your IT job for the dog odor eater. Yeah, if we get this off the ground, you know, there'll be nothing better than seeing this in the shops. We feel that this is the one. Although David thinks his product is the one, the dragons are yet to be convinced, Doug Richard in particular. I, I honestly don't understand what problem you're solving. So hear me out. I'm a dog owner. Okay. I got a retriever. Um, not the smartest dog in the world, but certainly ranks up there as being one of the more smelly dogs. You know, she's, she's rich, ripe yeah. with odor. And there's, our current solution to that problem is my children wash the dog. Now, my dog has a mat. It's actually a blanket. My dog loves her blanket. You know why she loves her blanket? It smells. It smells of her. Yeah. Now, eventually, that blanket gets to a point where we think, that smells a little bit too much like our dog. So we wash it. It seems to me that a large portion of the world has a blanket and a washing machine. So the real question is not whether or not it works, but whether or not people care. Are you really solving a problem here? Yeah, all dogs smell, whether you like the smell or not. A lot of dog owners we found are conscious that a room smells of the dog. But it's not like we're going to stop washing our dog. If there's no problem, there's no need for a solution. Doug Richard is having major problems with the concept of MaxiMat. David needs £50,000, but he's struggling to interest any of the dragons in his business. Peter Jones is preparing to bail out. Dave, firstly, I think I'd, I'd like a ticket to your planet because I've never seen anything quite like it. I think that what you've come in with today um, is just not an opportunity, let alone a business opportunity for an investment. I don't believe anybody will put any money into that. I think you're running down a very dangerous road to currently give up your day job to go and sell um, that type of product. If you don't sell anything, you are in real trouble. And I just question, really, why you've even turned up today. So I just want to say, you're not going to get a penny from me today. The first dragon is out. David's mat has completely failed to impress Peter Jones, and his chance of getting the £50,000 he came for looks small. Rachel Elnor is still in, but she needs convincing. David, how are you going to distribute this? How are you going to sell it? Through shops? We've got um, a website currently under construction. We want to advertise it, radio, TV. TV? Do you and know how website. much a TV ad costs? Yes. How much? For a, a package of adverts within one of the regional TVs, you can get 32 slots. For £50,000? No, no, for less than that. It's, it works out about £25,000. David, you don't want to go and just put money into TV advertising until you prove to yourself and to others. You need to start testing sales. We've, we've, we've tested this product with friends and family. Now, I'm talking about getting an editorial in your local newspaper, putting it on sale in some local shops, and seeing if you can make some sales. Yeah. You tried that? We haven't tried it as yet. Like I say... Because if you came to me and told me that you'd sold 100, I'd believe it, you'd believe it, an investor would believe it. Mm. David is unable to prove there's a market for his product. While Simon Woodruff is trying to help him out with some practical advice, Doug Richard decides to get straight to the point. It is the number one responsibility to yourself and to an investor <clears throat> to prove a concept. You have jumped over a step. You've proved it to yourself in your mind, to no one else, and you're about to take my money and spend it in a heroically inappropriate fashion because 50,000 pounds will get you nothing in the way of advertising on TV. It will get you not enough impressions to make an impression, and you will therefore go to zero and be out of business. And you will never know whether it was because it was a failure of capital or a failure of product. Like I said, 
We have tested the product. Testing the product. Look, you can't just give it to friends and family and test the product. You have to find a stranger who gives you cash. That's we have, testing a product. We have had strangers, as you put okay, it, buy the product. They're, they're well, I know. Anyways, I apologize. Don't, don't. I am out. Doug Richard has given up on David and his Maximat. With him and Peter Jones out, David could be in real danger of losing his chance for investment. I think this has got all the ingredients of a classic business failure. You've got an innovative idea, but not quite unique enough for someone to go out and specially buy it. You've got bags of optimism combined with just total naivety about the amount of marketing spend you're going to have to do to get there. I just... I don't see it working, and I, I, I worry for you, actually. There's and no I need to worry Peter. for me. I worry for you giving everything up and all your savings and putting everything into this, because... That's I think how much it's I a very, in the very steep business hill to climb, so I won't be investing, sorry. Rachel Elnor is also out. David came to the Dragon's Den for £50,000, but there are just two dragons left, Simon Woodruff and Duncan Bannatyne, who's not in a forgiving mood. When you walk into the bank and you ask the bank manager for a loan, and he says no, all your friends and family tell you the bank manager's wrong. When you go an investor and he says no, all your friends and family say the investor's wrong. You've got a fantastic idea. But one day you have to wake up to the reality and understand that your friends and family are wrong and you're wrong because this is not going to sell. No one's going to invest in it and I'm definitely not going to invest in it. Okay. It seems David's hopes of success are fading away. Peter Jones, Doug Richard, Rachel Elnor and Duncan Bannatyne are all out. Simon Woodruff is his last hope. David, um, I, I'm contrary to some cynics around me here. I think that you've got a good product, and I think you're absolutely spot on that TV advertising is exactly the right way to do it. Um, back of Sunday colour supplements, all of that, exactly, even shopping channels. And I, I would have thought there was an enormous market. But you've got to prove that something sells on something which you don't know like that. And you didn't do it, and that's why I'm not investing. Go away, and you'll find an investor if you sell some. But I'm not investing. Thanks. So, after a crushing experience in the Dragon's Den, David has failed to secure an investment. But he's leaving the Dragon's divided over him and his product. He could sell shed loads of those. Why don't you invest then? You'd need to Sorry? sell Why don't you warehouse invest loads Because to make it's any not money. proven. It's, not it's simple loads. as that. I bet he goes away now and tests it. He's going to go back to his wife and say, I we're going to so. test this. I He's hope learned so something today. Sake. Maybe. But we don't have to beat the guy up because he's somebody who's taken the trouble to get off his ass and yeah. find a way out That's and to sit it there with with all of you guys beating him up as if he's worth some dragons and he's something give them some encouragement i feel for him because he is going to fail and lose his money if he doesn't Lose so educate him, but don't beat him up. That's like he's what some we big were trying to do. To... If you I didn't hear that at all. I just, oh, I you, heard you. He got advice from every single listening. one of us. Listening to all of that, four out of five of them were skeptics, severe skeptics. You're still going to give up the other job, give up the day job, and pursue it. Yeah. It's still there. I mean, whatever they say, one, one of the chats was quite complimentary, the others were uh, a bit dismissive. But I think one of the things that was, that was worrying them was that you were convinced of the product to a degree beyond any sort of reasonable evidence that you had. If I was pessimistic about the actual saleability of the product or whether it worked, then I wouldn't be here because I wouldn't like to sell something that doesn't work. We believe in the product and whether they believe in it or not, it doesn't matter. Over the last few weeks, the Dragons have invested hundreds of thousands of pounds in new business ideas. Will our next entrepreneur be successful? Barbara Simpson Burks from Derby is looking for 250,000 pounds. Morning Dragons, my name is Barbara Simpson Burks and I'm from Tattooy Rays. We're looking for £250,000. We've all got a view on tattoos, most of us hate them. 
even those that love them to start with gradually get to hate them. Now let's consider the scenario. There's the young woman. She would have traversed deserts for the man in her life, but now he's married, three kids. She wants to move on, but she's still got that evidence on her arm. Now, if you can get a system that removes tattoos safely, economically, doesn't need medical staff to run it, this is very different to any other system in the world. And you know, as fast as we're taking them off, another kid is having them put on. And that's another exciting thing about it, is self-perpetuating. Because after we've removed the tattoo, the skin is in perfect condition, they can have another one put on, should they wish to. We've done the homework. We know the market out there. We're getting 8,000 hits a week on our website. The phones are ringing. We've had to have new phone systems put in, more staff. We've got it patented. We've got international patents. And we've got world rights on this tattoo removal system. We've got the enthusiasm. We've got the excitement. We've got the ability. But what we need now is more money to progress it even further. Barbara needs £250,000 and she's prepared to give away a 20% stake in her company. She's clearly passionate about the business, but will the Dragons feel the same way? So Barbara, how does it actually work? It works very similarly to the way they have the tattoo put on in the first place. We put on a magic fluid, as we call it, which is obviously our secret, I'm afraid. And we go over the tattoo in a series of dots in a very, very similar way to the way they had it put on, with a tattoo gun, if you like. What happens is the little area scabs up, rather like a chicken pox scab when you're a little girl or a little boy in most of your cases. And when the scab falls off, the pigment comes out with it. So you're left with little areas of clear skin. Right. Um, if you can see what goes on here. You're going to show us pictures of scabs yeah. now. No, this is, this is the... Oh, God. Isn't that horrible? There's the tattoo at the top, and this is where the area's been treated, and that's the clear skin coming through. Obviously, most treatments will take about a year to go through. Right, and the cost is? Most clients will spend about £1,000 to get rid of a tattoo. Are you administering this, or are you now going to sort of license this so you've got hundreds of people around the country that's who right. are using we, your system? We're already setting up franchises throughout the UK, then Europe, and then the world. Barbara has big ambitions for her groundbreaking tattoo removal system. Her plan to franchise it to beauty salons across the world make it seem a promising investment. So you've actually got these patents granted? Yes, international patents. So you, you invented this serum? No, not at all. Uh, what happened was I was bombarded with emails from a chap in Germany, the chap that invented the magic fluid. He doesn't own the patent, you do. How does we that the work patent. then? You'll need to speak to my husband's wished about that. The, the inventor is not a businessman. We're the business side. He is the inventor. Could, you, could you bring up? Do you mind? Does anyone have a mind? No, I think we need to see. I think you guys are a team and we're going to have to hear both sides. We this, are so. a team. Even though someone else invented the tattoo removal fluid, Barbara says that her company owns the rights. The Dragons want to find out more about this unusual arrangement from Barbara's husband and business partner, Richard. Hello, I'm Richard Simpson Burks. Hi, Richard. You own the worldwide patent to that magic fluid? Yes. What about the inventor? What does he have now? Well, um, we've built up a very good level of trust with this gentleman, and he offered us half of the patent rights. You own half, half the patent rights, or all the patent rights? Half the patent rights. We have 50% between us of the patent rights. Barbara said, we have the worldwide right, or to Dan, we have the world rights to this product, this patent. And when you say we and you're selling shares in a company, we assume you mean the company. Right. Duncan Bannatyne has established that Barbara and Richard do not own all the worldwide rights. They only own 50%. The other 50% belongs to the German inventor. This isn't going down well with the dragons. And with this in mind, Rachel Elnor wants to establish just how successful their business really is. How much in the past 12 months revenue have you generated? Um, in the last 12 months, re revenue generated is minimal, £10,000. That's not what been, we, we've been working on. But Barbara said your phones are ringing off the hook, you're having 8,000 yeah. hits on the website. Yeah. You've, you've got to bear in mind that uh, we can only get so many people through the door in Derby to remove tattoos. It's, uh, it's a very limited space to do it. We're short of franchisees. 
Okay. Um, we've, we've so what's got your projection for the, the coming 12 months then, given you've got this huge demand? Setting up the franchises, I say we've started off with three What's your now. financial projection for the next 12 months? Well, you're... Um, um, for, for, the, for the individual franchisee at the bottom of the park, as we're running the, the, the business in Derby at the moment, i.e. one outlet removing tattoos, that, that should be comfortably doing within the year well over £100,000, possibly £200,000. It's very difficult to know how to do it. Richard is struggling with the figures. He needs a £250,000 investment, but Rachel Elnor is deeply unimpressed. Barbara, when you came up and you did your presentation, I, I thought you were fabulous and you painted this wonderful picture. And I really hope when you brought Richard up that he would be a really accurate backup that I think your marketing side needs. And so in that respect, I'm sorry to say this, Richard, you've let the presentation down. Oh, I'll talk to him later about it. It's, it's not an investment that I would get involved in, the way that you framed it, so I'm out. Rachel Elnora is out. Unfortunately for Barbara, her husband Richard, stumbling over the figures, has cost them both dearly. And Duncan Bannatyne, who's shown no interest so far, has heard enough. Let me just t tell you where I am. Um, I think we know where you are. Get a move. You're very opinionated, Barbara. We're all opinionated. If you, if you run a business, you are. I, I, I'm I, sure I, I, you I, all are. Regardless of whatever's been said, I don't believe there are enough people in the United Kingdom with tattoos who are going to pay a thousand pounds to have them removed for this thing to work anyway. I'm sorry, you're so entirely wrong. I know you think million. I'm entirely wrong. You haven't convinced me there is. The people aren't there. I'm sorry, you, you've, so you've missed it. You've missed the point. I, I've, missed, I've, I've missed entirely this investment. Okay. I'm completely out. I'm not interested. I'm not investing. Duncan Bannatyne is out. Three dragons remain. Peter Jones, Doug Richard and Simon Woodruff. They think they're being offered part of a potentially global business. But Richard is about to drop a bombshell. The company that we're talking about will be Tattoo Erase UK. We're talking about the UK franchise here. We're not talking about the world rights. I mean, come on, gentlemen. A quarter of a million pounds, you're not going to buy the world, a share in the world rights. Richard has clarified the deal and shocked the Dragons. In return for a quarter of a million pound investment, he's only prepared to give the Dragons a share in the UK arm of the business. He wants to retain the worldwide rights for himself. This is causing Peter Jones major concerns. I've sat here quietly. And you I'm, have, and I, you've been very good. Yeah, thank you. You've come here to try and gain an investment, haven't you? Yes. You haven't put a structure together that actually gives me a real input to owning anything of any substance apart from potentially a rollout of a franchise. So my conversation is quite short and sweet. From your perspective, you're not clued up, Richard. You're not clued up on the figures, the financials, and actually what you want to do with this. My primary objective is to evaluate risk. So I'm not going to invest today. Barbara and Richard are in real trouble. By keeping the worldwide business for themselves, they've lost Peter Jones. They want £250,000 in exchange for 20% of the UK business. Three of the dragons are out. Only Simon Woodruff and Doug Richard remain, but one of them is about to provide a glimmer of hope. I really like you. Thank you. <laughs> and I like your style, and I think that you know what you're doing, and I just get that sense about you. I think you've got a very, very sexy product. I think that it's about making space available to do new tattoos as well. That is a part Not of it. It's just a negative thing. It's a very exciting thing, and I think I could work with you. I've got that feeling. And what I'm going to offer you today is I'll put 125 in for 10% of the overall company mm -hmm. and I'll put my services in at least for the first year free of charge. And that's my offer to you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, but I'm in. Into everything. Simon Woodruff has amazed the other dragons by offering half the £250,000 that Barbara and Richard came for. But he wants 10% of the whole business, apparently including the worldwide rights. To complete the deal, Simon needs someone else to put in the rest of the money. Doug Richard is the only dragon left, but he's confused by what deal is on offer and wants some straight answers. The difference between Simon and I, apparently, is I, I need utter clarity 
because you guys have managed to confuse me comprehensively. So what I'm trying to understand is, are you now offering a share of a worldwide business or are you offering a share of a UK business? Just I think saying. we could discuss that with you. We'll discuss it's it. Very okay, oh, no, 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 no. It's not going to take you people to behave like yeah, that. So You've got to so behave. Uh, I want one of you to come in. Okay. I want one of you to come in. Give me right. Then be quiet long enough for me to have a shot yeah, at this guy. But, but, you but, want me to back in, then fine. Good. I think I do it. not go understand you. Fundamentally, is what am I buying right now? You say I didn't get the plot. You walked up here and offered me a share of the UK. You're saying I want a share of the total company. It's debatable. It's a decent conversation between decent. These are serious businessmen. Hey, These I'm trying to find people. out something, but and I will if you stop long enough. They? I'm trying it's very hard to get... This is not a deal, deal. This is about two people working out what's no, best Interestingly the enough, Simon, this is where we part company. Because if you were offering part of that larger business, the worldwide business, which is, I believe, what Simon asked for, and he's asked for someone else at this table to step up next to him, then I have a <coughs> bloody well right to know whether or not it's the worldwide business today or whether it's the UK business. It's a completely straightforward question. It's, it's the utterly essential question. I will offer a share of the worldwide rights, and to be perfectly blunt with you, I would have been amazed if we'd have got away with the UK franchise. Well said. If you want to invest at the level that Simon's defined, that's fine. We'll talk about it. Under pressure from Doug Richard and Simon Woodruff, Barbara and Richard have done a complete U-turn and opened up the deal. This is the latest in a string of surprises. Now they're talking about the worldwide business, Will Doug Richard invest? I'm not impressed. Coming in saying, I'm going to offer you just the UK is against the worldwide rights. The dimensions of the opportunity that you now change. It's like saying, I'll offer you one or I'll offer you ten. Let me put this to an end. I couldn't work with you guys. I wish you the best of luck. But the fact that you're willing, willing to go from the UK to the world, I don't know what will happen next in our relationship, but I won't like it. Um, I, I'm out. Barbara and Richard's crafty negotiating tactics have lost Doug Richard. With the rest of the Dragons already out and Simon Woodruff only offering half the money, Barbara and Richard are left in an impossible situation. I've tried my best, guys. Yeah, I've so done much. my best. I think it's great what you're doing. I'm sorry that it hasn't happened. Don't worry. We'll still Thank do you. it. Thank you, you very much. You Good luck. Yeah. Good luck. Yeah. yeah. It's all over for Barbara and Richard. Doug Richard was the only Dragon left to add to Simon Woodruff's offer, but by changing the deal at the last moment, they lost his trust and his money. Although Simon Woodruff was willing to invest, he still wasn't prepared to put in the full amount. Were you serious, Simon? Absolutely serious. Well, why don't you put your money where your mouth is instead of playing with these people? Why don't you put 250 in? Put 250 in. Put your money where your mouth is. I have an amount of money in my mind ready to invest, and it's deployment of what funds you have. Right, I agree I'm absolutely serious about that. What a great thing. You've got to start putting your money where your mouth is because you're in here, you're saying, yeah, 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 and then you're sending this, sorry. You know, if you really believe in it, put your money where your mouth is and invest in them. What about the mood of that encounter, Barbara? Oh, I thought it was quite fun. You, you know, were described as opinionated at one point, I think. Yeah, well, I am. People in business are, aren't they? I mean, you don't get anywhere if you're not. You can't be a wallflower, can you, when you're in business? They said this man let you down. They said he oh, let you down in the presentation. Oh, he'd never let me down. Absolutely not. No, not at all. Half the time, they were not listening. And bloody Duncan, he was not going to listen, come out of high water. Uh, Duncan had made his mind up virtually as soon as we started that he was not interested. But we could have worked with Simon. He's on our wavelengths. He was... What was the deal, though? I mean, he was talking about 20% of the worldwide rights to everything, as far as I could see. You weren't going to give him that, were you? Well, no, but we would have negotiated that afterwards. No, I mean, but it's a fundamental feature of the negotiation. Yeah. That's yes, why we could have stood up there. Am I said... buying the house or am I buying the fence down the side of the, the garden? I mean, that's a huge, huge difference, isn't it? Yes, but we, we, we would have sold the whole house, but the price would have been negotiable. Other entrepreneurs bold enough to face the dragons included Natasha Mason, who tried to dazzle them with her range of novelty aprons. Today I would like to present to you a new kitchen fashion label called Tasty. Perfect for little sweeties, bite-sized babes, gourmet girls and beefy blokes. Tickle your taste buds with Tasty aprons. She thought she had it all tied up, but her kitsch pitch failed to impress. 
I think it's pretty ludicrous that you came to ask for an investment today. You're not really a businesswoman, are you? Your whole product and presentation is just one word, and that's, it's just a gimmick. Yunus Ali was pitching halal cuisine, a new range of convenience food which he says will suit a strict Muslim diet. OK, you may be asking what is halal. When Muslims talk about halal, it means the way the meat is killed and it has to be blessed. But he soon discovered that honesty isn't always the best policy. There's, there's lasagna at the moment, I don't feel it's the right taste for me. OK, so you're not sure yeah. of the quality? That's a real alarm bell to me. I'm that... just not interested. I'm not going to invest in you. I'll see you when I'm loaded. <laughs> We will create real jobs for real people producing really good beer. Gordon Wetzel Stewart and wife Petra had high hopes for their Glasgow-based brewery. Have you any track record of running a brewery or a restaurant or a bar? Uh, no. With no experience, they didn't last long. You are going to charge me 70 pence per pint. No, I'm not. I'm charging you 75 pounds per keg. Well, which is 70 pence per pint. It doesn't add up to me. It's like you're talking another language to what bars and restaurant operators do. I'm just trying to work out what you're charging me per pint compared to what I'm already paying per pint to see if I can buy it of you per pint cheaper than what I'm already paying per pint. You will be able to buy it. But I don't example, know what it costs you... per pint of you because you won't tell me. That may be the worst business pitch I've ever heard. Now, our next entrepreneur is Rachel Lowe, and she had her business idea while working as a taxi driver to pay her way through university. She's looking for £75,000, but she has to get at least that, or she goes away with nothing. My name is Rachel Lowe, and I'm the Managing Director of RTL Games Limited. I'm pitching for 75,000, and this is my first product, Destination London, being launched this year at Hamleys of London. The Portsmouth edition is being launched at Cascade Shopping Centre in Portsmouth. Now, I came up with the idea for this game whilst working as a taxi driver in Portsmouth to pay my way through my university law degree at the University of Portsmouth. I then spent several months researching the industry and I found a huge gap in the market. Tourism. 30 million tourists go through London every year and it doubles up as a perfect souvenir of the city. The players' pieces are miniature London taxis. The destinations on the board are all famous tourist attractions and the idea of the game is that you have to earn as much money in a shift as possible. Further investment will mean that I can get future additions to market which include Destination New York, destination Paris, in fact any capital city of any country. It really is a fantastic investment opportunity. Thank you for listening. Rachel is looking for £75,000 in exchange for a 30% stake in her company. With her finished sample and her promise of a launch at Hamley's toy store, she seems confident. But will she persuade the dragons to part with their money? Can I look at the board? Of course, yeah. How do you play it? Um, you all start at the rank, and the idea of the game is you have to get to as many destinations as you can. Can I go in any direction I want once I've thrown the dice? Yeah, you can. So, if I got a three and I go to this traffic light, it that means one. that you pick up a traffic light card, and then you follow the instructions on the card. That's the kind of thing it'll be. You have been caught doing 30 miles per hour, pay a £60 fine, and you will receive three points on your licence. So. In this game, then, if I get 12 points, do I lose my licence? You do, and you have to buy it, right. buy it back for a fee. And it's an enjoyable yes, game? Yes, it's good fun. And it, it does work. It's been tried many times. Rachel's working hard to interest the dragons in her board game, but a good product is only part of the package. Doug Richard wanted to know about her marketing campaign, and in particular, her launch at the best-known toy store in Britain. Tell me about your Hamley's relationship. What exactly have you agreed with Hamley's? Hamley's are going to launch this product. I mean, they're the most established uh, I, I, You can assume I know who Hamley's is. Okay. They're going to launch this product. And what does that mean? To... I mean, they could launch the product by, for example, 
putting a table in the front of the store and stacking it high. That's a launch. A um, high profile launch. I'll have some celebrities there with uh, you know, celebrities that have got children. You're going to pay the celebrities or um, organise the celebrities to come to Hamas? No, organise the celebrities to come to Hamas. Right. What are Hamas actually doing off their own bike with their own money in their own time? Well, all they will do is they will organise the press um, and the media to be there. Um, what I will do is I will make sure that I've got um, you know, enough promotional material outside. What you mean is that Hamlet's will tell the press there's going to be a launch mm -hmm. and the press will decide whether or not to turn up. And even if they do turn up, then the newspaper will decide whether or not they want to print it. So you might get nothing out of it. Press-wise? Press-wise. Possibly. It's not going well. Rachel was pinning her hopes on her Hamley's launch, but the Dragons are sceptical. They aren't convinced that a celebrity-endorsed board game will guarantee her any publicity at all. Rachel Elnor needs convincing on other matters. Rachel, how many units of Monopoly are sold a year? 700,000. Across the world or in... In, in um, the UK alone. Isn't that a pretty big competitor? If I was looking for a board game which is a souvenir of London, aren't you up against a massive competitor there because it's the biggest... Well, you know, Monopoly is the most established board game, but what I've got to do is get a distributor that will give me the same presence within the marketplace that Monopoly has. This will sell. Any Distributors game don't give you market presence, and you have to have a sales force to persuade the retailer to tell the distributor to send it. A distributor is a place where stuff is held. So you, you misunderstand the role of the distributor in the marketplace. They don't push products into market. They don't have the net profits to do it. But Rachel. Hasbro is the market's leading distributor. And yeah. if they have a product that is in Woolworths, then they advertise it, and that is why they're the market's leading distributor. Do you know how many new games are introduced every year? How many new games? In, yes, board games. In the UK market, um, I think there's about 20 each year being introduced. And what percentage of them last more than a year? I don't know that. Okay. Rachel's struggling to answer the questions, and under the scrutiny of the dragons, she's starting to look unprepared. She desperately needs £75,000 of investment. Simon Woodruff has made his decision. Rachel, um, I think it's brilliant what you're doing, and it may do very well. But I don't think it's an investment, because I don't think you're far enough on. It's very hard for a third-party investor to actually make an investment in somebody who's not actually got that business experience. So I think you're going to do well with it, but it's not an investment yet. Okay. Rachel has lost the interest of Simon Woodruff, who's not prepared to gamble on her lack of experience. He's the first dragon out, but Peter Jones has similar concerns. Rachel? Hello. Um, from my perspective, I think that the gaming market, we all know, is very competitive. And I think what you're trying to do, I think, is very inventive. But the level of experience that you've got in running a business is obviously of a major concern. I don't actually want to invest in somebody that actually is going to go through that learning experience because there's going to be so many and too many pitfalls. Okay. So on that basis, I'm not going to invest in the business. Rachel has also lost the confidence of Peter Jones. So Rachel Elnor, Doug Richard and Duncan Bannatyne are the only dragons left. Although Doug Richard has already spotted some major flaws in Rachel's business, he hasn't finished with her yet. So what's your fiscal year? When does your year start as a company? You are a company, right? I'm a company, yes. Yeah. You're a limited company. Yeah, so I've been set up limited since November. What level of revenue are you committing to create in the first year? In the first year? Yes, the one that okay. starts at the at beginning of December this year and ends the end of November next year. Um, I would say minimum 30,000 units. Can we use um, pounds sterling instead of units for the purpose of discussion? How much money do you intend to create? How much revenue do you intend to take in um, in the first year? In the first year, 200,000. Okay. Will you make any money on that or will you lose money on that? Make money. So what is your estimated profit at the end of the first year? Loosely speaking, I'm just trying to get a feel for it. Um, Doug Richard is the last person any entrepreneur would want to face if they didn't know their figures. And Rachel seems to be out of her depth. If she can't give convincing answers, she's going to lose him. The pressure is on. If 30,000 units are sold within one year, 
the net profit on that is 190,000. No, the gross profit on it might be 190,000, but the net profit certainly is not. Is well, I was working me? out the difference between £8.50 and the. Um, oh, so you were working out the gross 70. profit. Okay, well, I'm probably okay. misunderstood. I'm interested in your net profit. I'm interested in whether the company, after running its overheads and your salary and everything else, ends up with a profit at the end of the first year. And the answer is. Okay, um, the estimated profit on that is approximately 180,000 for the first year. Okay. You've just lost me completely. My We can't even have a basic business discussion. It is entirely impossible for you to have a £190,000 net profit on £255,000 of sales after we've just gone through a discussion that your costs are greater than that. To have all of these figures in my head. It is not a matter of precision of numbers. You know, I don't care if you're even close, but you don't have in your head a sense of it. What annoys me is that you have managed to put all this effort and time into something and yet stand here in front of me and be a wasted opportunity. I'm annoyed for you, I'm annoyed at you. Um, maybe this is gonna be the best learning experience of your life and maybe you will succeed, but I'm out. Okay. Rachel has been torn apart by Doug Richard and her confidence is vanishing fast. She still needs to raise the full 75,000 pounds she came for, but just two dragons remain, Duncan Bannatyne and Rachel Elnor. Her chances of winning them over look slim. I'm, I'm amazed, actually, that you could not know the difference between gross profit and net profit. No, and I do know the difference. I just got confused with the question because I didn't have my figures in front of me, that's right. all. Not from a sheet of paper. You should learn it. Um, I think you probably regret not having done that today, but that's a learning curve. So I hope you've learned something and you've learned enough to continue. So I'm out as well. Thank you. Duncan Bannatyne has also been put off by Rachel's shaky grasp of the figures. With him out, the only dragon left is Rachel Elnor. It doesn't seem like you've prepared very well to come in front of us today. You don't know the difference between gross profit and net profit. You haven't got the figures in your head. Quite apart from the fact of whether it will sell or not, and I think there's big question marks over that. It will sell because it's not only got the tourism market, it's got the mainstream market. Rachel, I'm I do feel for you because you've come, you've come into this environment. You remind me of a bit like a sort of lamb to the slaughter in some ways. I think your presentation was a bit confused. I don't get the sense that you've just got that, that kind of business snappiness. Um, it really isn't an investment for me. I, I'm afraid I wouldn't back you. It's the end of the road for Rachel. She's leaving the dragon's den with nothing. When it came down to it, it was Rachel's pitch and not her board game that cost her the investment. She just seemed too nice and just be eaten alive in business. She was a crappy investment. Rachel, you must have been taken aback by the sort of negative reaction you got. I was, because I mean, I've done lots of business presentations and I've always coped with it. But accounting isn't my strong point. I can't have figures in my head. It's something that I do need on paper. But there's many successful business people um, that don't necessarily do the figures, but, you know, they'll have someone else. And when I'm successful, I'll have someone else doing it for me. <laughs> Another budding entrepreneur who failed to make the grade was Stuart Twin, who came with his bio bin for storing smelly rubbish. Four day old organic kitchen waste. Ah! You don't need to come near me. Ah! That's like my... I thought it was Duncan's aftershave. And it was Duncan who thought he sniffed out a. Empty room, fill it up, talk is cheap, listen up. I don't know where we went wrong, but I feel I'm shaking these walls, yeah. Nothing safe, gotta take cover. Still alive, we just make clutter. Running and running, yeah, we got off track. Now we under attack. Problem. When you opened the door, 
and I came close to it. I could smell it. Well, no, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that... No, I could line, smell so it. I could so smell it. Okay, well, obviously, I'm disappointed that that's what you, you, you smelt there. I'm struggling to see why anybody would want one of these. Jenny and Bill Conway wowed the dragons with their Formula One-style car you can drive on any road. Basically, this car can do 0 to 60 in about three and a half seconds. The idea was big, but the business was small. What would make me excited about investment is how you're going to become a success. You want us to fund a business that funds your passion. We're thinking, what do we get out of this? Most investors want to be able to make money. But at least they nearly sold a car. How much do you want for it? That one, yeah. 35. I'd be interested in buying the car, but I wouldn't be interested in investing in the company. Next up was Sean Costello with a state-of-the-art karaoke system, which lets anyone record their own CD or pop video, regardless of talent. You are rocking to the shangling sound of the music. But his plans for a karaoke empire were too ambitious. Why on earth would you want to be in some rush to launch five businesses at once? It's too much, too soon, too early, too complex. My little brain just won't take it all in. It is starting to get complicated, but the whole point is it is very simple. Next up is Paul Thomas, a PhD student from Sheffield. Now, he thinks his research has led to a scientific breakthrough, but he needs £75,000 to make it into a business. OK, hi, my name's Paul Thomas, and I'll be representing my company, Mycorrhizal Systems. And we're looking for an investment of £75,000. Now, Mycorrhizal Systems is a company based around the production of black truffles. Uh, the truffles are actually a form of underground mushroom, and it grows in conjunction with tree roots. And the demand for these truffles is currently so high that they command more per unit weight than is paid for gold on a wholesale price. That's £1,000 a kilogram based on last year's prices. Because of this um, high value, many people have tried to cultivate their truffle but only very few have succeeded. What we've developed is an enhanced technique, and using this enhanced technique with 2,500 trees, we can expect a turnover in excess of a million pounds within this five to seven years. And what we're asking for is the 75,000 pounds is to buy land so we can set up this plantation. There's also the potential of a 10% profit share, and if you take this, this will give you an income of in excess of 100,000 pounds a year. So in summary, Mycorrhizal Systems represents an environmentally sound, financially secure and potentially very high-yielding investment. So thank you for listening. Paul has come up with an unconventional plan to use his own research to start a truffle plantation. He needs £75,000 to buy land and in return he's offering a 10% share of his profits. But before they get down to business, Duncan Bannatyne has a problem. Please, please excuse my absolute ignorance. Yeah. But I have to ask, what is a black truffle? I've never heard of them. OK, sorry, yeah. It's a very highly prized uh, form of fungus which grows underground. And it looks kind of like a warty black lump almost, but they command very high prizes. They're you what do you do with had, them? You must have had them at the ivy, sprinkled over your pasta. It's food. Yeah. It's the yeah. most yeah. delicious yeah. gourmet... <laughs>
Paul wanted to spend £75,000 on buying land for his truffle plantation. But Doug Richard has discovered that he hasn't actually grown any truffles yet. Simon Woodruff needs convincing. How do you know whether this works or not? We or when will you know? Uh, pretty time before they start yielding will be five to seven years. So before we know that we can that they're producing these top yields will be then. So you've got to wait five to seven years, and the investor's got to wait five to seven years to see if this works or not. So you had me. You mm -hmm. appeared so confident. Yes. And you seem to know your subject so well. Yeah. But now I'm thinking this is a great big gamble. The dragons have realized it could be up to seven years before Paul finds out whether his extraordinary venture has succeeded. This is a long wait and a big gamble for any investor. For £75,000, Peter Jones isn't prepared to take the risk. This seems to be such a dream, and it's a dream beyond belief. All I can tell you is that if this works, guys, it's going to be great over five or seven years. You can't expect an investor with any level of solid thoughts, apart from this may be a bit of fun, to invest in that business. And, Peter, and I, Paul's presented that. really well, and actually you've come up with something that I suspect is, is unique and actually very marketable, and I think you should be applauded for that. Well, Rachel, you need to hold on to your money because you're going to lose it very quickly if you've got that attitude. At the end of the day, actually, if it's not no, going to make you money, if it's not going to make you money, put, you shouldn't be interested. The proposition so. that Paul's put forward is actually, this is an investment in a piece of freehold land with a profit share on what you can yield. Yeah. So actually, from that point of view, it's actually a pretty good investment because you're investing in a piece of freehold land and we all know where land goes ultimately o over long periods of time. Generally speaking, it goes up. Well, I could invest in land tomorrow. I could go and pe if somebody could come and pitch here, I'll stand up there and say, three pieces of land, Rachel, there you go. Here's £100,000 I want today. But we it's all a know land increases. That's not a reality of life. It's a protection on your investment, well, isn't it? That's a nonsense. It? I think for, for me, we may as well go and invest in a garden centre because that's what the reality is. They and, do very well, Peter. And, and, I, and I'm sure they do. I don't think this is ever going to make money. This is a pipe dream from university that you've had. So I'm out. The first dragon is out. Paul's truffle plantation has created a huge difference of opinion between Rachel Elnor and Peter Jones. Duncan Bannatyne has thought of a different problem. Truffles worth more than their weight in gold left in a field? If you don't secure your land before you start harvesting the truffles, they won't be there when you go to harvest them. We would have to have very strong fences put in place. Where's the money coming from? Uh, for the security. Yeah. <laughs> Come as soon as we start to harvest the truffles, so as soon as we start to harvest them and get them out, and we know they're producing, then that that first year's profits would be incorporated. Into I don't know if you're putting the chicken before the egg or the egg before the chicken. How can you harvest them if they've been stolen? And how can you fund security if you haven't harvested any to, to fund it? it? It doesn't work out. It's bizarre. Because the, the I, I think you're in dreamland, honestly. I think you should really try a different method of, of, of making money out of this. Yeah. And so I'm not going to invest. <laughs> Duncan Bannatyne is out. The dragons are pulling apart Paul's idea bit by bit. With no means of protecting his valuable truffles and a seven-year wait for uncertain results, Paul's proposal looks more like speculation in land than investment in a business. And there's more bad news. Paul. Yes. I'm not really interested in buying land and hedging. I, I think that's a, it's an elegant proposal. I think there's a category of investor who will find that attractive. What I find interesting are high-risk, high-return investments. Yeah. So I wish you the best of luck, but I'm out. So far, Paul has not persuaded anyone to invest in his adventure. Duncan Bannatyne, Peter Jones and Doug Richard are all out. Whilst they aren't prepared to throw their money into his idea, it seems one dragon might be. I think this sounds a lot of fun, Paul. I really do think this sounds a lot of fun. How much is the land going to cost? Uh, we're budgeting the 75000 for the land, but potentially we could get it a lot cheaper. How much land? Five hectares. Do you know where it is? I know. I've got several... I've got a uh, rough lot with me here, this black area here. This has to be in a particular part of France. Yes, yeah, these are proven areas where it grows wild anyway, and they're on the right bedrock, the right soil conditions. Yeah, what about if I just went and bought you a piece of land? How would we do the deal? Um, well, I think at the end of five to seven years, 
Yep. Did I get my land back? It's my choice. Yep. And then we're both free to go each other's ways. But if I, if I was a truffle plantation on it, it's producing very high yields, it will, it will be worth, okay. worth a very large amount. All right. And also, if I'm going to put the time in, as long as it's producing a large amount of truffles, I'd like to keep that land going and keep the plantation going so I've got a constant income from it. It'd be good okay, to... Okay, well, I think if I'd earned, say, the £75,000 mm -hmm. plus, say, 100% return over that period of time, a minimum as a, as a bottom, yeah. Yeah. the land would then transfer into the company and be owned by the company. Yeah. So far in the Dragon's Den, Simon Woodruff has not made an investment, but he's showing interest in Paul's grand plan. Will he go all the way and invest? What percentage of the company would you give to me? I was looking at a 10% profit share or equity share, how, however we work it, uh, negotiating. What about 25% ownership of the company? I'm not, I'm not really sure uh, as to the... Uh, pro possibly... Let me think about this and I'll come back to you on this one. Simon Woodruff is stalling, but Rachel Elnor has yet to show her hand. Will she decide to gamble on Paul's 75,000? adventure I think almost always in business nothing is a, a guaranteed surefire thing there's always risk and uncertainty in business and actually that's the fun of it yeah. this is yeah. like a pen little pension fund that's type investment and I think it's interesting and I'd go in 50 50 with Simon on that basis yeah, and I would treat it as a speculative investment but I, I, yeah. I actually like you and I think you need someone to to back you are you are you interested Simon? So yeah First of all, I'm not interested in doing a deal with anybody else involved. Yep. I'm not interested if Rachel comes in. Okay. I think we'll have a very, very good relationship, mm -hmm. and I think we'll do other things together. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm investing in. I'd like to be your mentor, and I'd like to really help you. After a series of battles with Rachel Elnor, Simon Woodruff has finally put his money where his mouth is. He wants nothing to do with Rachel, and has decided to go it alone and invest the full £75,000. Paul, listen. I won't stand in the way of Simon, but I'm upset that he doesn't want to do the investment with yeah. me, but I'm happy for you to, to do that deal. Okay. I'm happy with 25%. Yeah. And um, if you're happy it's a deal, and you go down and find the land, I'll buy it. Yep, time to go. Done. Okay. Okay. So look out the nation for truffles, right? Paul's got his money. Despite the uncertainty, Simon Woodruff and Rachel Elnor were both keen to invest, but it was Simon who clinched the deal. You can go now. <laughs> <laughs> Simon's answered his critics. I can't wait to fish your trouble, Simon. Simon. Yes, you well can. done, seven years. How long are you going to wait? I'm really upset that you didn't want to go into investment with me there. It's nothing to do with you, Rachel. I think this is one deal that I just want to do on my own with a guy that I like, straightforward. It's a relationship. Yes. It's not just about a deal. And as soon as you get three people, you know what it's like in bed with three. <laughs> Maybe no, fun, actually. but it doesn't work. But please tell me. Paul, yep. well done. Are you happy? Uh, yes, yes, very happy. I uh, thoroughly enjoyed it, and I think I secured a very good deal with Sam in there. So yes, very happy. But I hadn't, I hadn't planned on building up such a big business, but with Simon's help, I think it, I think it could be very exciting and very good. Now, what about there were a couple of them who were just totally negative, didn't yeah. you bite? Well, I mean, were you surprised at that? Um, no, no, I wasn't surprised at all. I think, um, uh, I think a couple of people, perhaps because I didn't explain, explain fully, uh, uh, probably my fault in communicating the idea. Oh, you've been very polite. I mean, one of them yeah. didn't even know what a truffle was. I mean, that yeah, was... but that's fine. I, I don't expect them to know what a truffle was. Okay, well, uh, really good luck. Thank you I very hope much. it goes well with Simon. Cheers. We've had some unusual business ideas in the Dragon's Den today, but only Paul Thomas got his investment, £75,000 for a truffle farm. 
Those who didn't succeed shouldn't be discouraged by negative comments, though. As Peter Ustinov observed, if the world were to blow itself up, the last thing you'd hear would be the voice of an expert saying, it can't be done. Goodbye.